Okay, so uh, for the new business, uh, we have uh, the city uh, presenting the financial plan, and I'd like to introduce uh, our mayor, Dennis Kremski, and Dennis will introduce uh, the rest of his uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak today. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Councillor Kalada, Councillor Wong, Councillor Matichuk, Councillor Byer, City Manager Gary Sapatelli, uh, yes, and oh, Casper, sorry. Um, uh, again, thank you. This is our annual uh, presentation. We've added uh, a second part to it as the, with uh, Thompson 2020. So I'll go through the uh, 217 financial plan. Uh, and then uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Tim and Harold to do the Thompson 2020 uh, presentation. So the budget highlights, mill rate comparison and tax result comparison uh, are, the, uh, are the contents. Uh, we're looking at the highlights, tourism funding of 200000 for tourism group to be formed by the Thompson Hoteliers, uh, to be funded by the Accommodation Tax and Economic Development Fund Tourism Reserve. We annually... Uh, receive in the in the approximate amount of five hundred thousand dollars annually from the five percent on each uh, room uh, night for the city of Thompson, um, and from that we've drawn two hundred thousand uh, dollars and been in discussion with the hotel association group. We're in the process of being incorporated and signing off on an agreement uh, with the city of Thompson uh, with the mandate to in increase uh, bed nights year over year uh, moving forward. Economic Development Officer to be hired by the City of Thompson. Uh, we've completed the application process. We're in the review, review of applications and we'll be doing, conducting interviews in the near future uh, with the anticipation of hiring an Economic Development Officer for the City of Thompson. And the decrease in business tax, uh, we're decreasing it from 4.49% to 4.24% for 2017. Uh, other highlights, 2016 RCMP surplus funds of a million dollars allocated to the General Reserve uh, to fund potential future RCMP expenses, uh, guard costs, wages, etc., and to cover CSO funding pending the provincial government approval of the 2017 grant. So basically we have 38 officers that we are billed for annually. Um, we range between 31 and 38 in actual. And so anything that we're underbilled, not anything that we're underbilled against the 38 budget uh, that we budget for, uh, we put into reserve because uh, if following the national scene with the RCMP, a couple things are happening in regards to uh, uh, retro pay settlement with the RCMP the past three years, starting 2015, 16, and 17. Uh, the unionization of RCMP members, uh, the severance cost pay uh, um, uh, agreement that they've uh, agreed to with Public Safety Canada. Um, and also from on the second half of that, the CSO funding, uh, our funding for the province, it was a two-year pilot project that expired on May 25th of this year. So to, uh, um, to in ensure that our CSOs had employment for the full year of 2017, uh, we have covered off the province's portion while we negotiate with them uh, for full funding for eight CSO officers to the end of 2017. $150,000 funding for the 2018 Manitoba Games, $75,000 operating allocated from within existing budget, $75,000 capital allocated from the Economic Development Tourism Reserve, and that's happening in March of 18. Uh, section 164 of the Municipal <coughs> Act states the financial plan must be inc include a balanced budget. That's the mandate of every municipality in Manitoba. 2017 is not a re reassessment year. We're on a two two year cycle. Uh, so the next reassessment is in 2018. No significant variations to assessments for residential properties. Slight reduction as the NCN Urban Reserve is removed from the assessment and included as a grant in lieu as per the agreement. So that was signed uh, with Canada in July of last year, uh, which the Mystery Lake properties are designated as Urban Reserve. Um, the fees and fines scheduled uh, increase of 1.5 consistent with the 2016 tax increase. Uh, year over year, the rates, if they aren't adjusted up or down based on need uh, from, a, from uh, an evaluation of administration, the annual increase is on last year's tax increase. So it's 1.5%. Census numbers were one of the few communities in Manitoba that saw an increase 
from 13,123 from 13, to 13,678. Unfortunately, with the, uh, the uh, grants that are provided by the province of Manitoba uh, in transfer payments that are census-based, uh, we increased higher than the Manitoba average, so the increase actually costs us $30,000 in grant revenue. Uh, sorry? Less than the Manitoba average. So we, we uh, last year got a little over $3 million. Uh, this year we'll get 2.997 or so around that. So uh, unfortunately, and we are lobbying with the province of Manitoba and Canada in regards to those formulas. Um, our thought is it should be, uh, if you increase, you should see a grant inf uh, increase. If you decrease, you should see a, a grant decrease. Shouldn't muddy the water with averages of this and that and that, because at the end of the day, we increased by 500 people and we lost $30,000 in grant revenue. Uh, next one, oh, this uh, million dollar allocated general reserve from the RCMP surplus. Again, I, I've talked about 38 officers as opposed to the complement of 31. Uh, other expenses, have I uh, talked about uh, the retro pay was agreed to by Public Safety Canada at 1.25 percent for 15, 1.25 percent for 16, 2.3 percent market adjusted for 2016. Uh, the jail guard costs um, and the on the RCMP side and on the CSO side, as I explained, uh, with the expiry of the agreement and ensuring that our, our people could be employed in, at least until the end of the year. So we while we work out the pending agreement with uh, the province, uh, we allocated 180822 for those costs. Revenue highlights uh, $600,000 of the $3 million grant in Valley grant in lieu infrastructure funding is included to fund the 2017 capital, and 2017 is the last year of the grant in lieu agreement. It ran from 2012 to 2017, and the committees are in current negotiations with Valley for the grant in lieu for 2018 uh, and beyond. So total revenues, roughly $32 uh, million, broken down in those in various uh, spots. Uh, basically, 32% of it comes from the tax levy, um, and 17% um, comes from the grant in lieu, 17% uh, from transfers, 16% from sales of goods and services, and the rest uh, from provincial grants, licenses, rents, taxes, penalties, um, and return on investment, which is less than 1%. Uh, breakdown of the grants revenue, we received uh, per capita grant $2,119,000, uh, general support grant two hundred twenty-five, dollars VLT grant one hundred ninety-six, dollars firefighter grant that's for four firefighters, $328,000, MLCC CSO grant $15,000, cultural grant $9,200, transit operating $158,656, with that, uh, for not for seventeen. dollars uh, but looking to 2018, the province has notified those that have transit systems in operation, which is Winnipeg, Brandon, Thompson, Selkirk, and Flinflon, that the current funding will be held at the 2016 rates for 2017. And our understanding is at this point, 2018, it will be zero. It's a 50% funding. Uh, Mayor Bowman from Winnipeg, Mayor Crest from Brandon, uh, myself, uh, Mayor of Selkirk and Mayor of Flinflon will be meeting with uh, province seeking clarification um, on that uh, announcement that was made. The CSO grant 119,000, ambulance grant 198,000, uh, total operating 3.3. Uh, on the capital side of things, the gas tax uh, 708,000, municipal road grant 400,000, uh, total capital 1.1 million dollars. Sales of goods and services include ambulance revenues of 2.3 million, garbage pickup landfill of 1.1 million, custom work and transit, uh, 201,000, recreation revenues 769,000, VRCC including arenas, Norplex pool, fitness area, and outside rentals. The transfers uh, to the ca fund capital funds, the capital projects uh, from the gas tax, equipment reserve, uh, public safety reserve, infrastructure reserve, and the building reserve. Uh, economic development, tourism, the election, uh, affordable housing initiatives, landfill reserves, accommodation tax, uh, $500,000, general reserve, RCMP surplus of a million dollars. Licenses, permits, and fines include $45,000 in business licenses, $12,500 in animal licenses, $225,000 in building inspections, $125,000 in bylaw and traffic fines, 
and other small licenses and tax transfers are included in this revenue. Rentals, uh, we have a rental stream from the RCMP, a 25-year lease for the Public Safety Building. Receive rental revenue from your rural RCMP as well for their proportionate share of the Public Safety Building. And rural RCMP also pay a proportional share of the debenture for the uh, public safety building. Taxes added and penalties. Taxes added, $200,000. Results from a change in assessments during the year uh, after the assessment roll has been uh, submitted. Uh, buildings completed or updated. And penalties of $203,000 monthly amount of 1.25% on outstanding taxes. Reminder, taxes are due September 30th of this year. So the property taxes... Uh, Basically, uh, from the municipal side of things, a little over $10 million. From the school district side, roughly 8.6. Uh, business and education support, uh, 483, or sorry, business tax, 483,000. Education support levy, 1.488 million, and the special levy of 272,000. The accommodation tax, I've spoke to briefly, roughly around $500,000 annually. Uh, already talked about the, the initiative we're, we're working with the hoteliers uh, and the uh, allotment of $200,000 for, for the year 2017. Um, the agreement uh, has been amended to allow council to decide through resolution where the annual funding will be allocated between the following reserves. Uh, so the, the infrastructure reserve 50%, the public safety reserve, 20%, the affordable housing reserve, 10%, economic development slash tourism, the final 20%. And what does this tax fund? Uh, in 2016, you can see on the bottom what it funded in the, from the infrastructure reserve, public safety reserve, affordable housing reserve, and economic development slash tourism. In 2017, uh, the infrastructure reserve will, will fund uh, the City Hall, HVAC, Engineering Building, Ventilation, Cemetery and Road Work, and the Library AC Unit. Public Safety Reserve, uh, Vetter Bags, Extrication uh, Ram, Extrication Ram, and Small Capital. Affordable Housing Reserve will be the Homeless Shelter uh, contribution. Economic Development and Tourism will be the tourism group to be formed by the hoteliers. And that's, that's second call of this yeah, and then the, the second stuff, uh, also the small capital alarm panel, signage website and handyman <coughs> and infrastructure, uh, the Zoll Auto Pulse for the fire and emergency services, and the Thompson Housing Agency for 17. On the expense side of things, uh, status quo budget, only contractual increases included the RCMP contract, hydro caretake, caretaking, and CB, CBA increases. Uh, the CBA is the uh, unionized employees that we have with the city of Thompson. Landfill budget include 2017, no increase to taxes required to operate the landfill. Uh, full year community officer budget included. As I mentioned, we're funding from the reserves as we work with the province uh, to get funding from them, but they are fully funded for eight CSOs for the year 2017. Uh, again, on the expense side of things, just looking at the pie chart, the protective services uh, cost us 34%. Fiscal services, 20%. Transportation services, 12%. Recreation and cultural services, uh, 12%. Transfer from reserves, 9%. General government, 7%. Environmental health services, 4%. Economic development services, 1%. Public health and welfare services, 1%. Environmental development service, uh, development service uh, less than 1%. For a total of 32 And as I mentioned, we have to provide a balanced budget, $32 million on both sides of the ledger. Uh, cost by category, you can see that the blue is 50% of the pie. That is salaries and benefits for city employees. Uh, the next biggest chunk, 18%, is the RCMP contract for 38 officers. Uh, the next biggest is uh, debenture payments of 7%, and then the outside agencies, hydro, propane, water, goods and materials, repairs, maintenance, waste disposal, services from others, insurance, rentals, city equipment distribution, legislative cost, and allowance for doubtful... Uh, uh, debts and training and travel and other that makes up the pie. Uh, you can see the uh, the trend in regards to capital and operating. Operating being uh, pink on the bottom, capital fiscal being on the top, uh, and the trending of moving up over over the last uh, five years uh, in regards to the increases. Uh, although that we try to fix the budget annually, there are costs that are uncontrollables such as RCMP increases uh, that, uh, that we have to budget for. 
on the debenture side of things, we have, through the Municipal Act, uh, we have a borrowing limit of $33.5 million. There's a formula that goes, that's in place with your operating budget and the amount of debt load that you can carry. The new wastewater treatment plant requires a debenture room of $12.167 million. Uh, principal of $9.2 million is outstanding on, an on existing debentures, excluding utility debentures. And the total payment of $1.723,987 included in the 2017 budget <coughs> of that is broken down to principal and interest. The debentures by uh, individual debentures and year, uh, on the far right you can see when the debenture is paid for. So the next one up is the public safety building will be paid for in 2018. Um, and so the remaining principal is $435,362. Uh, the rescue pumper uh, for the fire and emergency services, it's up in 221. UCN Drive, that was our contribution uh, to the UCN development, uh, is up in 222. The Gordon Beard parking lot uh, is up in 2023, but that, fund, that specific debenture is funded by an annual, con annual contribution by the Nickel Days Corp uh, to pay for that. The VRCC uh, is up in 2027, the Recreation Projects up in 2027, UCN Drive and Burntwood South up in 2028. So that's the, uh, the total number of debentures that we have out. Uh, principal remaining $9.2 million, annual payment of 1.7 on each year of payment moving forward. <coughs> we have controlled entities that we fund uh, and that uh, we provided, uh, as, a, as a direction, we provided that the entities utilize surpluses where appropriate. Uh, year four of a debt reduction strategy being implemented, the recycling uh, center is paying back uh, 74,078 annually for 15 years. I believe we're in year four, right? Yeah. Uh, Thompson Zoological Society, 19214 annually for 10 years in the same year four. Uh, controlled entities, who are they? The Thompson Housing Agency, uh, allocated 50000 in 16, again in, in 17. Thompson Public Library, allocated 245 in 16, again in 17. Zoological Society, 85 in 16, 85 in 17. Community Development Corp, TU, was 50000 in 16, zero in 17. We're hiring our own economic development officer. The Recycling Centre was 240 in 16, 240 in 17. So you can see that's a flat funding. 2017 uh, community groups include uh, the following, the museum, uh, 60,016, 62,5 and 17, homeless shelter, 25 in 16, 22,5 and 17, the curling club, which is their insurance premium, 9,000 in both years, the humane society, 31,126 and same in both years, and it's a fee for service in regards to, uh, uh, for sheltering uh, and caring for or um, animals that are picked up by our control, animal control officer. Spiritway received $10,000 uh, to their initiative this year. Uh, they also received uh, 4277 for uh, signage. And the Chamber of Commerce received $4,875 for the uh, tourism study uh, that they're conducting. Capital funding, again, uh, we pride ourselves that we're one of the few municipalities that are able to fund uh, capital dollars without using operating dollars, with, uh, so without using property tax as uh, dollars for capital. Uh, fifth year in a row that we've done this. The debenture was budgeted in 2016 as included in the financial plan for the Norplex pool. This will still leave sufficient room to meet the wastewater treatment plant requirements. The Valley Grant and Lou agreement is, has included an infrastructure component and where it's in the final year of that agreement. As I said, currently committees are in place to uh, negotiate that agreement. Again, from the source of capitals, uh, the three or four biggest slices of pie, 23% uh, from the gas tax, which is federally, the Valley Inf in, uh, Infrastructure Grant, 21%, uh, Landfill, 12%, Infrastructure Reserve, 12%, Grants in General, 11%, uh, Deventure, Equipment Reserve, Building Reserve, Public Safety Reserve, and other reserves and trusts make up the, following, the, the remainder of the contributions to capital. For this year, 2017, the capital projects on Selkirk Avenue, we're continuing uh, $1.4 million uh, source of funding from gas tax revenues from Valet, GIL, and Municipal Road Grant. The Burntwood Trailer Court drainage is $250,000 funded by gas tax. 
City Hall, Fire Hall, HVAC, and Library AC, 180 grand, is funded by the Infrastructure Reserve. Princeton Multi-Use Path uh, is 160,000, funded by Valet GIL. Sidewalk Thompson Drive Course uh, is 160, and it's funded by the gas tax. Cemetery Road Work, 100 grand, gas tax, Infrastructure Reserve, and 2018 Engineering Services, $65,000, funded by the gas tax. We also added the uh, additional paving works uh, after the um, presentation was prepared. We're looking at uh, a couple other options as well. As we all know, the, there was a significant damage to our roads with the, uh, the, er the, the late snow and the early spring thaw. Um, there were sections of road completely lost, for example, uh, courts between the Thompson Inn and the Public Safety Building and the library. Uh, we're looking at options of instead of excavating two feet down or three feet down and then rebuilding up and recapping, where possible, uh, there'll be some drilling to make sure that the base is intact. If it's intact and good to go, then we'll mill off the existing uh, paving or what's remaining there and uh, reapply it back down without any excavation. Uh, significant uh, cost savings, which will allow us to do more repairs uh, moving forward. Capital projects uh, moving forward, uh, additional ones, the uh, equipment upgrades, the half tons, tandem gravel truck, uh, front load garbage truck, on demand water heater, chlorine pump upgrade, the GV lighting upgrade for 808,000. Uh, that's the funding source is the infrastructure reserve, public safety reserve, uh, building reserve and landfill revenues. Safety projects include engineering, building ventilation, better bags, the extrication ram, auto pulse and alarm panel, 152,000 by Infrastructure Reserve, Public Safety Reserve. Small Capital Signage website uh, is 135, Infrastructure Reserve, Public Safety Reserve. Landfill Capital, one-stop shop, multi-use building repair, environmental study, 195,000 for landfill revenues. And completion of 2016 capital carryover projects of a million dollars, uh, reserves and debentures uh, funded from that. So here's a pictorial, uh, this is Selkirk Avenue, the work that will be done uh, from uh, basically, uh, this is uh, the one way road all the way up to Selkirk, or sorry, Mystery, Mystery Lake. Um, in, adi in addition, uh, we're also uh, doing uh, the multi use path, which is this is the museum uh, starting from Mystery Lake and Princeton, coming up on, on Princeton Drive there. Uh, we've got a road renewal here, as I just mentioned, on Selkirk. And sidewalk here, uh, which is what street is that? Thompson Drive, Thompson Drive across from the uh, uh, Mystery, Lake Mystery, to the Mystery Lake to the library. Will it be a multi-use path or will it be a sidewalk? That one is a sidewalk because there's a, a paving stone on the opposite side. The multi-use uh, is right now came up to this point here and turned and went down tree road. On this side here. It's, it's as wide as a multi-use, but it's paving stone that was previously done under, <coughs> under the downtown revitalization. So, yeah. sort of, so yeah. it'll be paving stone on the other side then? No, it, it'll be so a con concrete sidewalk, concrete sidewalk, but it'll be wider than the existing because the existing was built in the 60s and the new, I don't know sure exactly what the width is, but it's a little wider, I'm going to say about a foot wider than normal, than what you see, uh, the, what you see there. And the uh, BTC drainage, uh, we're all well aware of the, the drainage issues in, in uh, the Burntwood trailer court and so on. Pipe, mid, and Oswagon, we've got some grain, uh, drainage to do to get it across and through this lot here to the, the, the main uh, catch basins on Thompson Drive. So Once just, just on that one there, is that when it was tendered out, it came in considerably over budget, so the project had to be uh, scaled down in scope, uh, and really the... Uh, the northern end, which is the Oswaga Drive end, uh, is the portion that will be done this year. Okay. Uh, debentures again, uh, parameters of the 2017, no additional debentures. Uh, again, looking towards the wastewater treatment plant. Um, carry forwards from 2017 with UCN pa uh, Drive paving, utility establishment, and the Norplex pool. On the utility side of things, the uh, PUB Public uh, Utilities Board <coughs> Approved an interim rate from 2015 to 17 in December of 14. The current rates are implemented January 1 of 17. 
and they were set at $1.46 per cubic meter and sewer rates were set at $1.66 per cubic meter. The 2017 flat fee is $123.03 uh, in 2016 it was $121. Includes 14 cubic uh, meters of water. A rate study was completed in 16 to determine the rates for 17 to 19 which is currently being reviewed by the PUB board. <coughs> On the capital side of things for the utility, we're looking at water main renewals, uh, Waterloo Avenue, Churchill Drive, Mystery Lake Road from Selkirk to Avenue to Churchill, Thompson Drive South from Cree to Oak, Staghorn and Beaver Crescent, wastewater treatment plant, and equipment such as shoring vehicles, storage, storage facility, lift station, and pump replacements. And so uh, pictorial around town, these are where you'll see the construction zones. The biggest two uh, will be uh, in this area here, which is Deerwood Staghorn uh, replacement, <coughs> and also the uh, Mystery Lake Road, Selkirk Churchill uh, are the biggest of, the, of them. Um, revenues and expenses have to balance on the utility, eight mil a little over $8 million. Uh, does not include the wastewater treatment plant of $36.5 million. So a mill rate comparison, looking at the, on the residential side of things, comparing 16 to 17, uh, no change in the education support levy. School district, you saw a change of 0.26%. City of Thompson, you saw a change of 2%. The total uh, change being a net of 1.19%. On the commercial side of things, the education support levy, again, no change. The school district, Mr. Lake, same 0.26. City of Thompson, 2.0. Uh, total commercial change rate is 0.94%. Uh, so using, again, our sample, we always use a sample of a $200,000 uh, assessed value. That's not market value. It's assessed value by assessment by the province. Okay? Um, the assessment is $200,000. That doesn't change. The school district, Mr. Lake, uh, with those rates plugged in, uh, that's the amount that you would pay, uh, and the change year over year is 0.26%. The city of Thompson, the change is 2%. The total tax impact is 1.19%. When you factor in the provincial rate rebate, if you're eligible for the $700, the net tax increase is 1.47%. Okay. On the commercial side, this is assessed again at a million dollars, not the, not the uh, market value, but the assessed value of a million dollars. No change in assessment, as I just said. The education support levy, again, no change in that, 0%. School District, Mr. Lake, 0.26%. City of Thompson is 2%. The total taxes is 0.96% uh, on a $1 million assessed value property, commercially. The result, uh, business assessment of $100,000 business tax, as I said, uh, we're reducing it from 4.49 to 4.24. Uh, the change is 5.6% uh, decrease. The special levies, uh, this special levy for water, storm, and sewer service line maintenance 2017 amount is 271.512, estimated at $83.80 per residence. 2016 amount per resident is what was uh, $117, uh, and this was passed uh, in the bylaw 1937-2016, um, and for the years of 2016 to 2020. What this is is this is the residential lawn repair water break cost. So all of us that have residential properties that are eligible for lawn repair restoration pay a premium of uh, last year we paid a premium of $117.07. This year you'll pay a premium of $83.80 so that if you have a water break outside of one meter from your foundation to the main, it's repaired at no cost. Well, the cost to you is $83.80 in your tax bill, but you won't see a bill for that water break. In, other, in communities like the city of Winnipeg, depending on the size of the break, but on average you're going to see a bill for around $5,000 from the city of Winnipeg that same break. In Thompson, if that break happens a meter from your property to the main, it's covered through this insurance policy that we all pay for uh, by, by this special levy. If it happens within that meter to your foundation or under your foundation, that's on you as a homeowner. That's your repair. Okay. 
Uh, special levies uh, continued to decrease in special levy, $33. Uh, basically, why did it go down? A reduction in number of breaks, the water main renewals, which include service line replacement, reduced water pressure in the distribution system from 58 PSI to 53 PSI. That was a significant minor but major change. By changing the PSI by 5 PSI, uh, we have data that shows there were, that there was a uh, change in water breaks that we're experiencing. We still have an aggressive environment that we live in, in the freeze-thaw and the permafrost, but just by changing to 5%, uh, by 5 PSI, uh, we've noticed a change in, in the number of water breaks as well. The net impact uh, overall on taxes, the net increases to taxes is $42. The net reduction in service levy of $33.27. So the bottom line change for a $200,000 assessed house is $8.73. And what does that mean? And basically, these are the breakdowns of that bill you get, in, uh, you get this summer that's due September 30th. Um, the bill of $2,898, two, uh, $2, uh, $1,926 is from the city, $1,672 is from the school district. Uh, then if you apply the tax credit of $700, the net tax payable is $2,898. Um, basically, the breakdown on uh, what you get for those uh, on the municipal side of services it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we've broken it down into the areas that are budget. Uh, I won't go through in, in detail because I want to get to the, the second presentation. But basically, there's uh, minimal, minimal in, uh, increases, if not decreases, in, in uh, the services that are provided for that. So in general government, again, these are the things that $212 buy you as part of your property tax. Protective services, $726 of your bill buys you these services. And in transportation services, $373 of your tax bill buys you these services. Environmental health services, for $73, it buys you these services. And public health and welfare services, for $25, you get those services. And economic development services, for $21, you get those services. Uh, for recreational cultural services, it costs you $334, and what you get is what's listed there. And the debenture payments of our debts is $161 out of your tax bill, and you're paying off the debentures that I went through previously. That's the scenario of the 2017 tax uh, implication. Bills will go out in July, uh, payable September 30th. Um, with that, I would open the floor to any questions. Sure. Question. Any questions? Yep. Anybody ask a question about the budget? Feel free. Yep. Boker, go ahead. Thanks, Dennis. I appreciate the uh, question that I saw at City Hall as well. I noticed on there you have indicated that there was some money allotted to Spirit Way for a number of presentations yep. that we did. Yep. And I'd just like to clarify something. Although we appreciate the funds, the difficulty becomes we don't understand what the rules are. They're very difficult to understand. There's been no formal acknowledgement that those funds are available. We don't know what the conditions are. In a number of cases, including last year, when we Spiritway did work on the adventure playground for kids, we had to go through eight months and four different finance committee meetings to get that money. And there was things done that we didn't know about. We, uh, we sometimes phone people or email them, and they don't get replies. So the difficulty is there has to be a cleaner, um, easier system how a nonprofit working with the city can get access to the funds that we do that. Nowhere that I know of all the funding that my experience has been with the Ski Club or Spearway, does a funder, when the when a project gets approved, the funder normally gives an amount at the beginning, and then when the project's finished, the report at the end where the final pullback comes. In this case, no funds are being released at all. We're building a sign for McLean Park, and we've been told. We won't, do, we won't pay you any money until the project is finished. So what we're doing Spearway, I'm using my own private credit card money to buy the lumber or the steel to get the project finished before we get the money from you. To me, as a, as a group that's trying to help our community, we need to find a better way to communicate easily, or more, or more symptomatically with the city of Thompson and those things. It's not only us, I know some of the other nonprofits are the same way. So I ask you again, to please take a look at that whole process of communication and working with the Okay, thank you for that. Thank you.
just to clarify, and, and we, we want to work with, with the community groups in, in uh, accessing the, uh, the funds available from the City of Thompson, understanding that we have a certain numbers of rules that we have to follow from an accounting perspective, that we are governed to follow. And so we can't write somebody a blank check and then, after the fact, uh, give us reports. So our rules, and they've been the rules since day one, is whoever is applying pays up front and we reimburse. Uh, or we pay directly to the supplier that's been identified. And so, yes, it's cumbersome. Yes, it's frustrating. But we also have rules that we have to follow. We'll, we'll work with everybody to try and make that easier. Uh, and, and certainly there are flaws in it, recognizing that. But uh, I'm not going to wear the hat of, of the fault of all of that. Uh, we can definitely share between the organizations who don't submit proper paperwork with our process, which is flawed as well. And so we, at the end of the day, to, for the benefit of the community, we have to work together so everybody wins. But certainly understand that we have certain parameters that we are legislatively tied to that we can't not follow. Okay, other questions? I just have one question. <clears throat> for the Winter Games, uh, there were two blocks of 75,000 yes. dollars. Uh, one was identified from the Economic uh, uh, Tourism Reserve. Yes. Is that the 200,000 that's going to be given to the hoteliers? Or yes. okay. oh, good, good question. That's separate. The 200,000 dollars is a standalone to be made available to the hoteliers. Uh, a group once the documents are signed off and everybody's agreed on that. Um, the upside of that through the negotiation we have, it's a, it's a multi-year plan for, uh, and speaking of the accommodation tax with the hotel. Uh, in the first year, we're in June already, it's not going to be uh, split by we're six months in, you only get half the money. We're allocating $200,000, the full allocation for 2017 to that group to start the initiatives to increase bed nights. But to your question, no, it's separated. The $200,000 is for the Hotel Association to increase bed nights. Uh, the Manitoba Games Fund was taken from the Tourism Economic Development Fund Reserve to fund the games. Two separate entities. Yep. In regards to North Vancouver, is there an update on whether or not the parents are allowed to stay in the hotel or not? Is there any update on that? I've called the city at least three times to find out if, I'm assuming now you're not going to continue the lesson because right. it's now almost the end of June. Yeah. But there's been no communication on whether or not there's going to be new lessons or accounts, if your account is going to get credited or if you can go and get a reimbursement. My understanding is that there's a notification on the, on the web page uh, that we are reimbursing uh, those that lo experiences losses because of the shutdown. Uh, I understand the department is looking at uh, rescheduling lessons, so nobody's going to be out any cash because obviously we weren't open and available to offer the service, and schedules will be uh, redone to to allow for uh, swimming lessons to, to move forward. And that information is on the the web page. Uh, I would encourage everybody to call the rec center at six seven 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 nine five two, because right now we're currently closed at the Norplex, and that staff is at uh, at the VRCC. So um, if it hasn't been communicated individually, I know that in general terms, I can say that, that the intention is to reimburse anybody that registered that didn't receive the service, and second, that they're re-looking re at the scheduling because obviously we have been open, so they have to revamp schedules. For There will be swimming lessons once we're open. Okay, other questions? Second time? Okay. With that, uh, I'm very excited to turn over the floor to uh, project managers uh, Tim Gib uh, Gibson and uh, Harold Smith in regards to the Thompson 2020 initiative. And I'll turn it over to them to expand on that. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a, uh, what's this, a soft launch of uh, Thompson 2020. Uh, my job today, or my assignment, is to at a high level, go through the why, what, and how of Thompson 2020, give you a little bit of a flavor on, on the process itself, introduce, I'm not going to introduce Harold, he can introduce himself, and then thank uh, Casper. Uh, Casper. Antoshevsky. Antoshevsky, sorry. Um, uh, for his help in communication, and you'll see where communication fits into the project overall. Uh, myself, I came to Thompson 
I came to Thompson um, with my family, wife and two kids. I have two daughters, 10 and 8, uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, we came out of Fort McMurray. Um, we just, I got out before the fire. My family was kind of there and in transition, but we got out. Um, I've spent 13 days working with or for the government. I've spent 30 years in private industry doing other things. I have a rich background, a rich history in terms of education, formal education, <clears throat> an MBA, an engineering degree, Six Sigma Green Belt, um, Masters in Project Management, hallelujah, that should help us. A bunch of things, but I've also spent 30 years doing a bunch of, bunch of projects that many of which didn't work, many of which failed. So I've got a few gray hairs, and I've seen a lot of things work and not work. So I just want you to know where I'm coming from on, on this. Uh, pretty much a balanced approach. I'm a current, uh, I sit on the board of directors for the Thompson Recycle, and I, Harold got me involved in Ringette, and I'm doing the Manitoba Winter Games. A little story about me. Usually I like to put a picture of my family. I met my, uh, <clears throat> my wife on the train to um, Churchill, or actually it might have been on our way back, not quite sure about that. More on that later, um, there's many familiar faces, but for those that I haven't met, thank you and I look forward to working with everyone. Without further ado, Harold. Thanks very much, uh, Tim, and, and thanks uh, to everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here again. I've got to say, I've never been so calm and serene during the presentation of the Thompson, City Thompson budget before. It was a pleasure to actually sit and listen to it. Uh, going back to my other, my old days uh, at the city, uh, oftentimes I was the one answering those questions. Uh, our presentation today is nowhere near as detailed. Uh, we're really just standing this project up. We were, we've both now been uh, assigned to, to help out with the project. Tim, with his extensive project management experience, is, is a wonderful guy to work with. Uh, We'll be back to Tim again to talk about uh, some of the process, but I, I said that I would do the sort of the front end of the presentation. Um, so, Casper, uh, if you could just go to the next slide. Uh, I know as a Thompsonite, as a long-time Thompsonite, I know that none of you are going to listen to me until you figure out where this photograph is. And so I'm going to uh, uh, cut, corner, uh, cut corners and, and save you the, the effort. If you're like me, the first thing you would look at is this here and think, well, that's the Burnwood River, and that's how I'm going to orient myself in this photograph, you would be wrong. Uh, it took me a while to figure it out that's not the Burnwood River. I've got to get an answer later on in terms of what that is. This is the Juniper area of Thompson. So this here is the Birch Basswood area, rest of Juniper here. Cree Road, where we are right now, is somewhere right in the middle of this bush. <coughs> and uh, so uh, obviously a very old photograph that, uh, that Casper brought up, but we just thought we would bring this up uh, in terms of um, giving a little, setting the table a little bit in terms of where we've come from as a community um, and the, the history of this community, this land that's been used for generations by Aboriginal people, uh, trapping and hunting and gathering, uh, took a, took, uh, saw a sudden change uh, in the late 1950s with the, uh, with the establishment of the mine in this community and our identity as a mining community has been going back and forth ever since that time. And it's going to see, and we've had many challenges in the community uh, over the years. I remember feeling it as a kid, not, uh, not knowing the details of what was going on, but knowing that, that this community was uh, subject to uh, the whims of, of the markets and cycles and changes in the, in the broader world and changes locally as well. Social changes in, uh, within our country and, and uh, all kinds of different development changes. So the history of Thompson uh, has had uh, tremendous positives and it, and it has had setbacks. Um, and I could feel that as a, as a kid, those changes uh, affecting people that I knew I felt it as an adult, as a homeowner, as I've gone through some of the, what people look, will look back now and say is might have been lighter cycles, but nonetheless they were cycles in the prospects of the community. Uh, we've been through many different challenges. The common thread, I think, is Thompson was in those days and continues to be a community of opportunity. Not a community where people come to seek opportunity for employment, in, uh, opportunities in business, opportunities to, for education, and to raise a family. 
And it's those common threads that we want to draw on. Those things didn't happen on their own. And the continuation of those trends won't happen on their own either. I firmly believe that Thompson will continue to be that community of opportunity. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here in this, in this role. And I think a number of people here wouldn't, be, wouldn't have pushed and credit to, uh, to, to Mayor Fenske and, and uh, some of the other partners, partners for pushing for this Thompson 2020 initiative. Um, uh, we want, we're confident that, that this is going to continue to be that, that community of opportunity, but it will not happen on its own. So if you want to slide ahead. Uh, there's, the, there's the modern photo of, of Thompson, or a more modern photo. And we, we can jump ahead one more time, uh, Casper. Sorry, I got talking too long on that first slide. Nerves. Nerves. Uh, it won't happen on its own. I think that there will need to be a, a fundamental change in how we view our community and our roles in the community. I don't know. That's just a sort of a gut feel that I've got coming into this project. But, but the, uh, the most recent news uh, probably represents, and people might correct me on this, one of the most significant um, economic challenges that the community will have faced in its history, uh, just in terms of sheer numbers. Um, it's going to be hard. Uh, there are going to be uh, uh, effects on the community that we're not going to like and on people that we know that we're not going to like. But if we are to shape that future and to... Um, manifest that, that outcome of Thompson continuing to be that community of opportunity. There are three core things that we're going to need to rely on. Collaboration among partners in a way that may take us outside of our current comfort zone. Uh, building partnerships both regionally and within the communities. And it's going to take a fair bit of focus and prioritization. Uh, Tim's going to talk a little bit about that under the section about how we work. Uh, but uh, a couple, a couple things. We've got the resources that Thompson 2020 has is support from the City of Thompson, the Province of Manitoba, uh, the federal government, Valley, uh, and but we've got two people part time working on this project, and a lot of leads for people that we want to talk to, uh, people that we want that we think want to be involved, people that maybe aren't aware of what of the contributions that they can make. We are going to need to leverage to use a you know, one of those jargon terms, leverage every bit of the assets that we have and try to and create an organization that, that has people sitting on uh, with groups and communicating and taking responsibility away uh, in, in support of the goals that we're putting together and that, that our steering committee has, has given us. We're still going to need to take a list that is this long. That's a terrible photo. That we're going to take a need, to need to take a list that is this long and prioritize it into a list this long for things that we can do in 2017 and this long that we can do in 2018 and, and this long for things that we can do beyond that. It's going to be a hard process. But if we don't, if we're not disciplined about focus and prioritization, this effort, perhaps like others in the past, can go a mile wide and an inch deep and won't make any impact. And so it's those sort of core principles that are, that are guiding this, uh, this effort. And Tim will talk more about the, the, uh, uh, the project management approach that we're, that we're using in order to, to, facil to fulfill those, uh, those uh, core principles. We can go to the next one. We've just got a, a general list of partners and collabor uh, partnerships and collaboration that we've uh, that we're, we already have on our radar in terms of ones that we want to reach out for. Uh, but a big one at the bottom is new partnerships. We certainly need, uh, as, as part of this structure, as we uh, start to flesh out a, a plan and a, and a project framework, we'll be hearing more from us in the future. And, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll ask Tim to, uh, to, to take over the presentation. Thanks. You can see we've got a <clears throat> multitude of stakeholders. And for me, uh, fairly new into the process, that's, a that's like a whole new language for me. So it's great to have Harold and, and everybody else that will uh, participate in this process help me. I'll get up to speed very quickly, but I definitely have a lot to learn. So I'm going to be an aggressive listener uh, throughout the process, at least initially. 
early on, um, I guess I had an appreciation that there was a lot of work that's been done. Some of it successful, some of it not so successful, but a lot of work, a lot of history. Um, Ted Wig, there's a bunch of different initiatives that have occurred. Um, and I realized that we needed somehow to show in the master charter, the, the kind of the top document, respect for the work that had gone on and then respect moving forward in terms of some of the things that uh, may not get selected. So this is kind of a pictorial I put on my whiteboard at about 5 a.m. one morning because I didn't sleep very well. And um, to me, it just means if you look at the center, the center ball, Thompson 2020 is going to identify several initiatives and, and a lot of that work uh, could span 10 to 15 projects. That's in play. But some of it's going to fall beyond 2020. Some of it won't, won't, won't get actioned within the, the mandate that we have, the two-year mandate. So it's not to say that that wasn't a good idea or it wasn't a good initiative. It's just not in the scope of what Thompson 2020. And that needed to go in. It needed, we need to say, we need to still engage and talk and, and, and review because it may not be appropriate and, and in play today, but it sure may be in, in 24 months. That slide right there is right in the uh, master charter. There's a bunch of ways we can prioritize work. This is one. It's very simple. Um, on the x-axis, you have an effort. And on the uh, y-axis, you have an output or a return. And then different, different projects, different initiatives could fall in different buckets. There's a bunch of ways that uh, you can focus and prioritize. Can I jump in there? Yeah, sure. I actually found one as a way to illustrate. This is, a, this is a tool that people have used for a long time, just in terms of a very quick way to sort of shake loose the, the project. <coughs> And, and to uh, to figure out which ones are the, the ones you should be going for in the short term and the long term. I just heard the one that was amazing. I think that this, this is why I, I, I didn't plan for this. But who would have thought that reducing the pressure in the water lines by 5 PSI would have reduced that, had made a big impact in terms of reducing the number of water breaks? That's one that if you, if you knew that in advance and you were listing which, which projects you want, which changes you wanted to make, that one would have landed in gems. Low effort but high, in, high impact and high return. Other projects are more strategic. They take more effort, but they long term will, will, help, will help you out. And I just thought that that's a beautiful example of, of different things, different uh, project activities and a way to prioritize them. That's, like Tim said, that's only <coughs> one way, that you, one tool that you can use, but this is one that we're, that we're looking at as a way to quickly uh, prioritize the work that we're gonna be doing. I guess because of my background, I've, I, um, I deal with data a lot, so as we um, develop the strategy or we develop a target, we develop what the current state is, I'm really big on data, survey data, um, background data, um, charts, graphs, pie charts, things like that, that we can show a difference. Because after all, 2020 is about getting some stuff done that make a difference. So next one. We're going to use a project-based approach. Um, we've already written, and it will go before City Council next week, the Master Project Charter and a Communication Plan. So those are the two um, kind of pegs in the ground we need. We need a Master uh, Project Charter that'll, that'll communicate what, what and how we're going to try and do things, not necessarily all the, the what, um, but at a high level, and then communication. So on a repetitive basis, um, there'll be communication, whether it's weekly, monthly, quarterly. Very transparent. That same communication will be put into um, two, two areas that I know of for sure right now. One would be a very visible area within City Hall. So as you walk in, there'll be the exact same communication that are, that's going out to different groups would be right there basically on the wall and on a, on a website. The project uh, components, so those four pieces that are in the center, they'll have a sub-charter. There'll be planning and execution summary. This is actually a planning and execution document blank. We need to get after what exactly the sub-projects are and then fill those out. That's a lot of work. There's a real art to that. Um, and then regular communication and consultation across all those stakeholders. Not an easy task. And then again, I mentioned publicly, publicly available progress reports. Absolute must. It needs to be a very transparent process. 
Go ahead. Areas of work that have been identified, transitioning affected workforce, retention and um, retention of citizens, and I think there's a, there's a focus there on retirees and attraction, shouldn't be just retention, business redevelopment, infrastructure and all weather roads. Kind of a very current event that's very appropriate. Those are the four. Right now we've, uh, just go back just for one second, just to tell you where we are in the process, we're just beginning to look at some, some of the work has been done, some of the thing at a very high level have been identified, we're just beginning to dig into the very top one. So within those, Tim, if I could jump in, within each of those, uh, we've started to refer them as four legs of the bar stool. I'm not sure if that's the best analogy, but we'll go with it. Within each of those, we see two or three, maybe as many as four distinct projects. So all of the work that we're focusing on will be in those four areas, um, but there, there may be different projects that where we look for people to participate with us businesses, individuals, government, levels of government, agencies to help us develop that specific project. And each one of those projects will have specific goals, a work plan, and, and, uh, and milestones that we'll report on. So I guess moving forward, these are, these are the next steps, really defining the goals and expected outcomes within each of those legs, identifying the sub-projects, identifying and recruiting partners, stakeholders and resources, defining roles and responsibilities more further for each of those pieces of work, establishing milestones, targets, dates, etc., and then implement, monitor, and report back, begin the cycle. A lot of work, uh, very excited to be here to be able to help and assist. Um, any questions? I guess I'll try and answer, or Harold or Dennis. back to the slide of the buckets of work or the table of the bar stool legs uh, so from the city's perspective the background work that's already started uh, and I, I want to acknowledge Ryan land in, in this uh, at the beginning of, of this session because uh, this all started with we, we know how Ryan thinks and then he puts it to paper and it's quite eloquent and it has a lot of merit and substance so this all started with a paper that Ryan wrote uh, as a suggestion of where we could go. So I want to give Ryan the credit of the initial thoughts and square boxes and circles that uh, we have now taken to where we're kicking it off now with, uh, with Harold and Tim uh, from that perspective. So I want to make sure that, that uh, we, we acknowledge the, uh, the author of the thought. Uh, and as we put meat on the bones and build the body, uh, at the end of the day we'll have a, a live person project that will see us through 2020 and beyond. So getting back to the, the initiatives of Thompson, the City of Thompson, as we've been working, as this has been moving along, we've been working on our own things that fit into that box. So for an example, in retention slash retiree retention, we've already started to talk with the province in regard, one of the things that was identified was quality of life, cottage lots, lakefront properties. We're already talking to the province in the development of the Faint Lake uh, Provincial Park, the, uh, what's the park proper and the north and south end of Paint Lake, which is not in the park proper. So we're looking at development of properties, lakefront properties. We're creating, we want, it, we want to, through this process, create the market because the province owns the land. It's, it's crown land or it's in the, in the uh, provincial park. We want to create the market for development and we're hearing strong that if the lots were available, people would buy them and build. So that's one initiative within retaining retirees. We have, uh, and, and again, I don't want to, uh, ignore the lower end of the scale in regards to not everybody uh, has a good job, high paying job with good pensions. We can't forget those that don't. But those that do who have disposable income want a quality of life that includes lakefront property in Thompson, or around Thompson. So here, that's one initiative that we're working towards to retain retirees and that disposable income in our community. In business development, Three things we just saw in the budget deliberate or budget presentation. One, we reduce the business tax. Okay, uh, that affects all businesses that pay the business tax. We reduce the, reduce the business tax in the, in 2017. We worked with the hotel, we're working with the hotel association for allocating $200,000 of that $500,000 uh, accommodation tax revenue to promote Thompson and the region to increase bed nights 
uh, in our community, which increases understanding that it's not normally Thompsonites that are buying hotel rooms. Okay, it's outside dollars that are coming in, and with that, that outside dollar also buys a beer at BP, a dinner at, at the Hub, a taxi ride, fishing services, whatever. That's a dollar that's coming from outside, so that's an initiative as well. In regards to the uh, uh, the other uh, other uh, initiative is before council right now is a uh, tax abatement bylaw. Um, it's a past second reading. We're gathering more information to bring it back for third reading. But basically, this is for uh, uh, business owners that own property. Okay, it's not for leases at this point. Not saying that that won't be developed at a later point. But this specifically is for prop business property owners to entice them, either new or existing, to expand their building or build new with a tax abatement uh, um, policy that allows them some relief from taxes over a five-year period based on their investment. So those are initiatives that, uh, back to the circle of Thompson 1234 and outside, it's in the small circle and that's from the city's perspective. There'll be lots of other initiatives uh, from other groups and organizations, individuals and businesses that'll populate the four areas, but that's an example of where the city of Thompson is plugging into the four, four chair legs. project-based approach slide, the last bullet you mentioned publicly available progress reports. Yes. Um, you probably already thought of this, but rather than having the stamp being available where people have to search for them, uh, if it could be publicly pushed progress reports so that, again, people don't have to look for them and ask We had a discussion uh, we're in the early stages. Our communication plan really laid out a schedule. It didn't talk about all of the methods, but for sure, yes. pushing information out is in our interest. Uh, uh, congratulations. <coughs> uh, obviously, this is some, Thompson, something needs and so on. I'm just curious when I saw your coach at the beginning that it looks to me that it's very bureaucratic, top heavy. You know, let's point? say always in strategic plans and so on, an idea pops up in a way that, let's say, a year from now, uh, Donald Trump gets elected as president, the oil prices drop, and nobody anticipated this year. This one? So, you no, know, uh, I think you had a, the, the stakeholders involved in the beginning with okay. all the different people today, right? So my question is, if the ideas come to you and there's only so much time and money to concentrate on any one, let's say all of a sudden now in six months you get ten, what's the procedure? Who decides what the priorities are? That's a great question. Sure, and and our intention is to not have it be a bureaucratic process, but we're accountable to a steering committee. That so the, the the project management approach really just defines it's a contract between the project management team and the people who put the resources in place. Who are who are the city of Thompson, province of Manitoba, government of Canada, and Valley are the are, are on the steering committee right. representing the sponsors. So in the end, one way so or the other, it becomes a political decision who cast the last vote to say this is the project to watch the project. Okay. Well, I just need to clear that in my own mind the process because lots of times there's good ideas on the table and they get struggled or they get filtered or by the end it's personality clashes and nothing happens. Right? That's my concern. I've been around this process for 45 years, so you learn a few things in business yeah. and how that goes. And I appreciate your background and certainly uh, Harold's knowledge, but I'm concerned about that is it more of the same. Now, how do we finalize it, or streamline it so it becomes an easy process and get results in three to five years? So the steering committee will meet at least monthly. They can authorize any change to any of our, of our, of our so the, the, advan the, the advantage of a project management approach is that you have a defined process for changing scope of work. And that's intended to make sure that we that you're, you can you can adjust, but at the end of the day, the guidance comes from that group. So I'll throw one other suggestion out there. I don't need to ask for council consent. In the 1970s, I was chair of the Thompson Citizen Advisory Planning Commission. We had a citizen group that looked at every single development thing that came in, made recommendations to council at the time because they were the authority. I'm going to say 80 percent of the time they approved that, but they didn't. We were just an advisory group. You may want to consider a business-minded advisory citizens group to help you with that because business people think differently than politicians and certainly civil servants. Just for your opinion. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I can just jump in a couple of things. Two, uh, to Boker, I think that to make it easy, if you focus on job creation and job retention, are two check boxes that would have to be met. In, in the 24 months span that we challenged these guys, 
That's the focus. There are longer term issues, but basically we're up against a job loss of 700. So what are we going to do to replace those jobs or retain jobs uh, to maintain the economic viability and sustainability of Thompson? Okay? That's what we need to focus on. Uh, but certainly, uh, uh, there's, as with the slide said, one of the slides said, there's no bad ideas. Let's throw it at the wall and see what sticks. But understand, we're up against a job loss of 700. Zero to 700. We don't know what the final number is. We know publicly it's zero to 700 within 24 months. That's what we need to focus on. Good point. We expect that, that we will be spending at least 50% of our effort in this overall project on bucket one, which is workforce adjustment. And that, that may include training, that may include matching up with other with other alternatives, but, but that is the, the that's the, the biggest um, uh, challenge that's presented itself, and that's driving. Uh, it's 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 if, if not driving this this bus, it's certainly uh, the engine. Just uh, there was one slide there you showed. I think it was the second from the last, just before you throw. And there was one item there that we didn't really get touched on was the all weather roads. Yeah. Yes. Could you just expand what's in that scope there? Or what's what? How that ties in? I'll jump in here. Sure. That came. That, the original Thompson 2020 had three buckets or three lakes on the school. The province did a three summits: one in the Paw, one in Thompson, and one in Churchill for the Look North project. Okay. And out of that uh, workshop here came uh, the initiative of connectivity with either electronically or all weather roads. Um, and so um, at that time, uh, we stepped up and said Thompson 2020 will be the carrier of that, understanding that it's it's bigger than all of us in the sense of the city of Thompson. It's more a regional perspective. Yeah, but we didn't want to lose that initiative out of <coughs> that came out of the economic center. Sure. Yeah, I know. I just wanted some scope to that because I was trying to figure out how that tied into Thompson 2020, like more specifically to our just, yes. It's, a, it's an add-on. Yeah. Uh, no. as, uh, as these and I sat them. at some of those summits, so I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you. Can you just put the phone number slide up there again? Sure. Those are important phone oh, numbers. We just added that. Thank and you. I just <laughs> to say to, uh, to the bucket one piece, uh, and I say this because I got a such a phone call this morning uh, from a small franchise that's been trying to set up shop at Thompson for some time that heard our news um, and said they see that as an opportunity. So their conversation kind of went, we're so sorry to hear about what's happening with your operations and that there will be a change. However, we've been struggling to set this up in Thompson. Could you, do you think there might be anybody interested? So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and send that your way uh, and it will become part of the workforce utilization. So if that's something that people already have some leads on, that's work that can be underway very quickly, and that's really what that bucket is about, is that somebody that would say, I haven't been able to find anybody, and we've got this group of highly skilled people, one group who will be available likely October of this year, another group August of next year, uh, and if the only thing is missing is some specialized skill, we already know they're an absolutely dynamite workforce, so uh, it's about getting them used in the region and making sure we continue to grow our own, so those phone numbers become important. So here's how we're, we had a good meeting with Ryan yesterday. So we are gonna, we're going to start to action those things at the, the project management level because they're timely and, and we, need, we need responses. Eventually though, what we'd like to see is a concerted effort and a mind shift in terms of that effort under, under that, that bucket one will be an individualized uh, effort to try to match people up with, with different opportunities. And, and if one can can actually help to establish a new business in Thompson, and also help to uh, have someone help someone to transition in their employment, then that's a double win. Absolutely, we'll be all over that. So just to, to add to that, to add to Ryan's point, and Rick, uh, um, the initial announcement in, in 2010, 11, uh, about 18, and the most recent announcement in regards to Bird Street again, can, can uh, land very negatively, uh, locally for sure, provincially and nationally for, for sure. Uh, and we need to, uh, as Harold uh, opened up with, we're a resi resilient bunch of homes, and we're known for that. Uh, but just to give a positive spin to, to what's happening this summer, with, with uh, Valet doing the loadout facility, 
with the city doing the wastewater uh, treatment plant, with the smaller projects like the Manitoba Liquor Control uh, System in regards to the, uh, the liquor store, with the Women's Crisis Center doing their renovations, with the Lions, Lions Manor uh, 55 plus uh, construction, uh, with various others, and I'm, I'm missing some, but with various other construction jobs this summer, we're looking at around $100 million investment in this community. So we're not dead. We've got a we've got a challenge ahead of us, but uh, it's going to be very very busy this summer, and uh, hopefully that will show others that it can be done and we can move on beyond 18, 19, and 20, and, and for many years to come. Other questions? With the new um, numbers that you're planning to make, are you looking at hiring more local versus? Yeah, go ahead. Depending on the scope of the work, and I had that question asked of me of the wastewater treatment plant in regards to that has been awarded to uh, uh, Bird Construction. It's a $36 million project. Uh, there's a tendering process. We've asked the question about the local hires. I know that uh, one contractor is, is part of that bigger contract, and I know that other contractors may have, may have submitted tenders and may have not got that tender. Um, that's based on a cost. Because any increase in cost is the cost of the taxpayers of Thompson. So uh, if it's costing 25 or 30 percent more to hire locally, uh, then the contract, the, the, the general contractor will go with whatever their price is. But we've certainly pushed and hope, uh, hopefully people will uh, realize the skill set that's in Thompson uh, and, and the, uh, the contractors or employees uh, will benefit from that perspective. Uh, at the least, uh, the, the uh, um, other services that are provided to those contractors, whether it be housing, food services, will definitely benefit by that, in, by that investment. Other questions? Keith, if not, uh, I'm sure we're uh, we, uh, Just before we wrap up, too, I noticed on our list of partners there, current partners, the Valley wasn't listed there, but I would just like to acknowledge the Valley is, of course, an integral part of this process. Thank you.